Delcane here, and this is my review of East 1 and 2 Chronicles Plus for PC. I've been trying to figure out a way to get into the East series for years now, always with the intention of starting from the very beginning. Normally, this shouldn't require very much research, but the East series is so bogged down with re-releases and reboots that it's difficult to wrap your mind around it. Suffice to say, Ancient East Vanished is the first title of the E-Series and was originally released in Japan on a line of home computers called the PC-8801 series in 1987. Hey, that's the year I was born. It also just so happens to be the release year for Final Fantasy on the Japanese Nintendo Entertainment System, the Famicom. Of course, Final Fantasy didn't come out in North America until 1990, whereas Ancient East Vanished, localized as East the Vanished Omens, debuted on the Sega Master System in 1988. East is an action RPG that reminds me more of Crystalis or even Legend of Zelda than Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest. Protagonist Adol finds treasures, levels up, and explores dungeons while collecting the ancient books that unlock the nigh-mythical land of East, but all combat is in real time. In fact, the combat doesn't even require any button presses. Adol can swing his sword wildly in an arc in front of him simply by bumping into enemies. Of course, assaulting enemies straight ahead is less than wise since he'll be likely to take damage when he does so. Unfortunately, attacking them diagonally is a pretty inconsistent method as well. The only tried and true method for defeating foes seems to be to attack them in a straight line slightly off-center. It's a very unorthodox control scheme to which I never became fully accustomed over the course of Ancient East Vanished's 5-hour running time. When we look at the original version of East, we see that it was only possible to move in four cardinal directions, removing the diagonal attacks from the picture altogether. This is perhaps why attacking diagonally is a little unreliable in this version. Suffice to say, the overall presentation of Ancient East Vanished is vastly improved from the original version, both in terms of graphics and sound, but it feels pretty safe to say that the gameplay is still pretty dated. There's probably a good reason why the bump system never particularly took off, even presumably within the East series itself. In most cases, it's simply not as satisfying as manually swinging a sword, especially since it's quite awkward to correctly line up Adol with his enemies. Admittedly, there's a certain level of satisfaction to zipping from one screen to the next, slaughtering opponents thoughtlessly by walking straight through them. Grinding never seems like much of a chore, since it can safely be done while traveling to your next objective. Ancient East Vanished, like many early JRPGs, is all about progression. You'll need to hit a certain level threshold before continuing on to certain objectives, or reach a certain amount of gold before you're able to purchase the next tier of weaponry and armor necessary to take on the next boss or area. Especially clever or thorough players, or just those willing to do their research, will find ways to expedite the process by exploiting enemies that give exceptional amount of experience or finding items to sell for a lot of gold. Unscrupulous merchant Pym is reportedly susceptible to negotiation on his prices for both buying and selling, for instance. However, Adol caps out pretty early in the game at level 10. Once he's reached that point, you've still got probably half the game left to play. You'll reach level 10 before you enter the mythical Darm Tower, which is of course 25 floors of dungeon crawling. You'll acquire massive sums of gold inside the tower, but since it's the point of no return in Ancient East Vanished, you'll have absolutely nothing to spend it on. I'd classify this as a pretty weird design decision. East does give you some choices on your loadout beyond this sword is stronger than this sword, though, by offering a variety of equipable rings with different effects. The effects are powerful enough that your choice of accessory is important. The shield ring, for instance, halves all damage taken, which would seem to make it the de facto choice However, the power ring doubles your attack power instead, which serves as a better choice if you've mastered the bump system and can avoid taking damage. The heal ring slowly regenerates Adol's health while he's standing still, even in the depths of a dungeon. This is an invaluable way to heal up in a sticky situation, especially since East affords players the opportunity to save anywhere. For some bizarre reason, your choice of ring seems to have absolutely no effect against bosses, which I learned through significant trial and error, particularly against the final boss. The first East title only has a few bosses, the first of which is unexpectedly difficult and annoying. Dodging his flames is quite challenging, and there's a very narrow window in which Adol is capable of attacking him. Conversely, the second boss is hilariously simple and literally only requires you to run around in circles. The final boss is ridiculously unfair and probably took me a good 30 tries to defeat. He hurls fireballs at you every step while bouncing off the walls like some demented demon pong champion and collapses the floor underneath you every single time you hit him. The fight is half puzzle, half bullet hell. It's an interesting design, honestly, but shockingly difficult considering everything that came before it. 
East 2 Ancient East Vanished the final chapter picks right up where the first game left off, which is probably why these two titles have been so frequently packaged together. Its first official North American release was as part of a compilation on the forgotten TurboGrafx-16 console, utilizing the CD attachment for some of the first animated cutscenes in video game history. It improves on its predecessor in just about every way. While enemies in the first title could generally be vanquished in a single blow, East 2's foes are quite a bit tougher, requiring multiple hits to destroy. This would be pretty frustrating if not for enhancements Falcom made to the bump system. Attacking enemies diagonally in East 1 was inconsistent at best, frequently resulting in a trade of damage. But for East 2, it's remarkably effective. It's more satisfying than ever to zigzag all over the place, unleashing diagonal carnage on Adol's foes. This does, however, nerf the difficulty a bit, but East 2 makes up for it by featuring lots of exploration, more boss encounters, and more options. While frantically ramming into foes was the only method of attack in Ancient East Vanished, the final chapter introduces a magic system to add variety to the gameplay. The new fire spell is required to defeat several of the game's bosses, whereas Adol's mastery of time magic allows him some breathing room when he's being swarmed by opponents. His new ability to transform into a cute fluffy demon is also required to advance the plot in a few situations, but also affords Adol the opportunity to converse with enemy demons that normally just won't give him the time of day. East 2 features a much higher level cap than the first game. I was probably something like level 53 by the time I finished it, maybe 7 or 8 hours from when I started. It's pretty easy to grind if needed simply by sideswiping enemies on one screen, running to another, and then returning. Enemies tend to respawn endlessly. However, if you're confident enough in your ability to not get hit, it always seemed to be more efficient just to move on to the next area since the rewards from defeating opponents increases exponentially. If you're underleveled for an area, defeated enemies will probably net you a level up after you've only killed a few of them. Considering the number of enemies and the amount of exploring and backtracking you'll have to do to progress in East 2, you'll probably end up with enough experience naturally. Bosses in East 2 generally boil down to shoot 'em ups that require you to wildly dodge a series of projectiles while hurling giant fireballs in return. All but two of the game's bosses follow this format and are generally pretty entertaining, even if a couple of them are pretty disturbing to look at. Fortunately, there's no boss as stupidly unfair as Dark Fact in East 2. The challenge level is appropriate and engaging. You're also once again afforded the opportunity to experiment with different equipment options. Aside from weapons and armor, which are strictly direct upgrades of each other, you have accessories that alter your gameplay in other ways. Sadly, the damage dampening shield ring is absent this time, but you do have access to a cloak that allows you to heal in dungeons, a ring that allows you to occasionally parry enemy blows, and an idol that causes your fireballs to seek their targets. Other items are more situational and must be used to solve puzzles or to advance the plot. East 1 and 2 are memorable because of their legacy, their ridiculously energetic power metal soundtracks, and because of some gameplay conventions that they helped to popularize. Although they were never as popular as some of their contemporaries, developer Falcom went on to produce a lengthy series of East titles, all of which I will certainly play at some point. I'm already a fan of their turn-based Legend of Heroes RPG series, which I've discussed at some length on my blog, and I'm looking forward to playing more of the East series and more of Falcom's catalog in general.